webcast actually comes from several conversations I've been having with some university students and also some uh, junior pen testers out there, uh, both at work and outside of work. And we've been discussing all kinds of stuff about Cabrillo's credentials. And I've noticed that there's kind of a, a bit of misinformation or lack of some of the basics when it comes to working with Cabrillo's. So I wanted to do kind of like a free webcast out there and that later on, I'll put it up over into, um, into YouTube to share with the community out there. Uh, this actually comes from a, a class that I initially started developing with Sean Metcalf, also known as Sparatech, uh, called Active Directory Attack and Defense Fundamentals. It's a class that is still under development, so I just simply grabbed one of the modules that was based on my Mimikatz class that I've given in DerbyCon and will be given in Troopers very shortly and just decided, hey, why, why not put it out there? So initially what I'm going to do, I'm going to start off with some of the basics on Kerberos, a very large overview. So what is Kerberos? So Kerberos is an authentication protocol for trusted hosts on an untrusted network. Now, we have to be very careful with this word trusted host because when we're saying trusted hosts, we're not saying that the Kerberos itself is guaranteeing that the host is not vulnerable or the host has been compromised. It is just saying that this is a host in the network that you define to me as a host that you should be able to trust. In the case of Windows, it is Active Directory. Active Directory actually integrates with Kerberos and says, yes, this host is part of Active Directory. I know about this host. This host was added to my network added to my trust net, uh, relationship matrix, you may call it. And you can trust this host. So we have to keep that in mind. It is validating the host at the other side. Another thing is that when we're dealing with Kerberos, we're talking with a service. We're not talking with the host itself. What we are actually getting is permission or we're being authenticated to be able to talk with a specific Kerberos enabled service. Um, this is why one of our favorite techniques when we land in a network, both for instant response and also for attackers is to enumerate all SPN service principal names because in Active Directory, that service principal name is what gets added as an attribute to each computer and says, this computer has this Kerberos enabled services available to be connected to and to talk to on the host. So normally when we are doing attacks in a network, if we're doing attack emulation, we line in a box, a simple AD query will actually give us all machines in the network that have services that we can interact with. Or if we're an insert responder and we land uh, uh, on a customer, many times what happens is that their inventory sucks. I have to be honest, I have um, very, very, very few customers actually have a very good inventory of their network. Uh, it takes um, a lot of effort to keep one of those. And many times we have to take the same steps that an attacker would do. We need to enumerate the director for all the hosts. We need to enumerate all of the services. So we know what would be of interest to an attacker when he lands on a box and also what kind of locks to look for on specific hosts. So all, all it boils down is that Kerberos is that glue that joins all of this stuff together. And the way that it does all of this is that it relies on tickets. And I'm just going to go very, very briefly, um, kind of like a 10,000 view on how tickets work before I go into the commands and, uh, themselves on how to do past the hash type of attacks. Uh, sorry, past the ticket types of attacks. So typically, a, when a user logs on, there's... Uh, security provider inside of Windows that will grab your password and it will get hashed uh, into three values uh, most of the time. One of them is going to be your NTLM value. The other one's going to be an AES128HMAC and the other is going to be an AES256HMAC. So your password gets turned in all, all of those three values and stored in memory encrypted inside of the LSS process. And when you want to talk with a box, uh, let's say you're RDPing into another box and network or 
let's say one of my favorite nowadays is that almost everybody's integrating their MacBooks inside of Active Directory and MacBooks are more prevalent. Now, when you join a MacBook into a network, uh, all of a sudden SSH and if they have remote desktop enabled, VNC also gets Kerberos enabled on those boxes and you can authenticate to them. So many times we are able to all clearly authenticate with Active Directory credentials using Kerberos to those boxes. So typically what will happen is that we're going to go into the KDC, we're going to validate who we are to the KDC, and then we are going to, once we're validated with the KDC, we're going to then request uh, what we call ticket granting ticket. That ticket granting ticket is what is going to allow me to then request a ticket to any other service. And then the KDC will give me that ticket. That ticket on itself will have some information that the service will then parse and validate with its own NTLM hash and say, okay, you've, you've been validated. You can connect uh, to my service. Uh, it will not even ask the KDC. It will only know that there's a certain secret between the KDC and, and the target host that only both of them should know for you to connect to those. And we're going to be abusing some of that uh, trust inside of Kerberos. So typically what we do, we do an AS request. So when the user logs on, his username and password, as I mentioned, gets turned into all of these different values or, H or hashes that are going to be then used to send over to the KDC. The KDC is to look inside of its own database, which is going to be Active Directory, inside of ntds.dit to validate who you are. And it will use that uh, to validate the information and say, yep, you're valid in the network. I have you in my database and you're somebody that um, I know of and you have your secret, which is that hash for your password. So you, you're, you are who you say you are. And then once we go through there, we're going to then be valid for the network. So uh, we do AS requests, uh, then we, do, we get an AS response that validates who we are. So that's step one or two of the handshake. Then in case of Windows, if you do a packet capture, there's always going to be an initial error and then you're going to be able to connect. And then we are going to request a TGS. We're going to request a service. Because right now, the only thing we've actually done is we've validated who we are. So the system has given me a ticket granting ticket, a ticket that I can use to get other tickets to go into other places. You can see it as if you're in an amusement park and you, let's go, let, let's say you're going into uh, a clone of Disney World and you just paid your entrance and you have your ticket for your entrance. That ticket will then allow you to get other tickets for services or rides. You can think of it as fast pass to get somewhere. So you need to go over there. You, you Once you go in with your ticket or your validation, uh, you can say, I need now a fast pass for this other ride. And Disney will check if you're a valid person that actually entered the park and says, yeah, you're valid. So let me get you now this other ticket that will allow you to bypass the line to be able to go in. So that's kind of like, um, a bit of real world analogy on how you may see this in the digital world. World. I don't know if it makes sense or not, but as a dad that has gone to Disney several times and been traumatized by it, it's something that um, kind of relates to me when I think about TGTs and TGS. So typically, what will happen is that when we request our TGS, our ticket granting, uh, our ticket granting service. Um, so we're requesting that what happens is that DC will open our TGT. It will validate the pack, the checksum of all of the values. And then once the, the DC validates that and says that, yes, you're valid, it will then grant me a TGS ticket that he's using the password of that host as part of the value that protects the ticket. 
So now when I send that over to the host, the host will actually use its own NTLM hash to validate, hey, I got this TGS. Is this TGS valid? Is it really for me? Uh, and it checks it out and says, hmm, yeah, it's valid. Now I'm going to give you access. Um, I hope I did a semi-decent uh, explanation there, a 10,000 foot overview of that, just in case if you want to really go into the details on how it weird. Uh, my recommendation is to simply go into Microsoft uh, documentation site and look for a document called How Kerberos Version 5 uh, Authentication Protocol Works, and it will go into the details on how everything works in the background, um, the different acronyms that you're going to be seeing, the different flags that you can have in tickets, and how everything actually works inside of Windows based on RFC 1510. Um, the document is quite long. Typically, when I do my Mimi Cats class and I go into Converse Basics, this is typically a 45-minute section of the class. It's just dedicated on all of the ins and outs on how Converse work. But for this session, since I only have one hour, I'm trying to keep it as short as possible and simple as possible. But I do recommend to you guys to go in and look for this document and read it in detail. And you're going to find information super useful there. So typically when we're working with Kerberos uh, and we have all of these different steps to validate ourselves, um, our different attacks, what we're going to be doing with past the ticket is that we're going to be hot wiring this process and just skipping several steps in it and depending on the attack that we're going to be doing with tickets uh, uh, no clue what that is um, just in case if you you can throw questions I have the chat open in another window I'll be able to answer questions for you guys if you have them um, just in case when we look at the multiple different attacks and how Cabros normally works uh, for example, a normal Kerberos user that authenticates, he has a lifetime of 42 days uh, with his TGT and renewing that same TGT in the network. Uh, what we're going to be seeing um, what we're going to be seeing what that happens is that um, there's going to be at the very least two different queries to the KDC that are going to happen. Um, normal authentication is available with smart cards. Normal authentication can connect to whatever host I want. Uh, Real-time checks of restrictions do happen. So in other words, there are checks to say, hey, Carlos is actually for, uh, from the domain admins or Carlos is actually from HR or uh, DevOps team and he has access to this host, to this service. So do let him access this service. Uh, so all of those restrictions actually happen there. Also a protected user uh, check for encryption actually happens. If you're a protected user, your account, if you're a member of that group, your account actually gets some extra protections on it. One of them is that it's not going to let you authenticate using NTLM4 hashes. You're going to be forced to use AES for your tickets so it raises the level of security there for those specific accounts. Normally, this is a normal logon. There's no indicators of compromise by the term compromise because it's a valid logon. Now, when we do overpass the ticket, overpass the ticket is the technique where I grab the hash and I shortwire that process. Uh, and with the hash, I just request my ticket by crafting my own ticket over to be able to get my TGT to access the network. Um, pass the ticket is actually when I actually extract a ticket from memory for the logon session or I extract a ticket from LSAS memory and I use that to then authenticate myself to the um, KDC to be able to get a TGT 
And there you can see real-time checks on restriction when you see that, that it says there 20 minutes after is that I can craft actually a ticket uh, for whatever user I want, with whatever controls I want. And the system is not going to validate and discard that ticket until 20 minutes after. I'll go into a bit more on that. Uh, let's say I'm doing TGS. TGS is uh, past, uh, a, a TGS ticket. I'm just grabbing a service ticket that exists already for that user. I'm just reusing that to reaccess a service or I'm crafting a new TGS to access a service. And then the silver ticket is when I can craft a TGS ticket with whatever information I want so I can use that in the network. Um, and a golden ticket is just a master TGT. Now, one of the things I do want to point out here in the table, specifically between silver tickets and, and golden tickets, is that the silver ticket, when you look at it, how many communications does it have for the KDC? In the case of the golden ticket, one. In the case of the sil silver ticket, zero. What happens is that all of the Kerberos authentication logs that get saved are saved on the target host in the case of TGS or a, a crafted TGS or silver ticket, however you want to call it. So in terms of tradecraft, uh, silver ticket tends to be more stealthier or it tends to be more OPSEC wise, depending on what you're doing. Uh, the only problem it has is that I cannot use it against every other host. So that is something that generally when we're doing operations, it is something that we generate, create, save into our C2 only for the specific purpose of if we lose access at any moment from our host uh, that we compromise, we can reuse that ticket somewhere else to access, again, that service. It is kind of like a backdoor or a backdoor key if we need it. Uh, if we want to stay OPSEC safe on some uh, environments where if we had gone with a golden ticket, more than likely a service like Microsoft ATA or a very good blue team that actually collects logs from the servers, uh, uh, from their domain controllers, is going to be able to see because not everybody has the storage or the money to pay to Splunk or to any other provider to pull all of the authentication uh, tickets from every single machine in the network and every single server in the network. Typically, they're going to get the most bang for the buck, so they're going to go for the uh, KDC servers, the domain controllers. So when we're doing pass the ticket, as I mentioned, what we're doing is we're hot wiring the process. What, we're, what we are doing is we're passing either a TGT or a TGS without uh, having to go to the KDC and initially request uh, and have the KDC validate who we are before it gives us a ticket. We're just grabbing the tickets are in memory or we're crafting a new ticket with information that we have to be able to then connect to the network. So the way it looks is that we no longer are going into the SSP and looking at the different hashes inside of it. We're uh, bypassing step one and two in the case that we're passing a TGT because what we're doing is we're just, hey, give me a new TGT or we're using a TGT that's already on the system. So we're bypassing those steps there. In the case of that we're passing a TGS, we're just going straight into the target box. We're just going straight to the service. We're just grabbing that TGS for that specific service that is on the box and we're just connecting to it. Um, questions so far, if there are any? Normally, I do suck trying to explain all the theory about Kerberos. Um, so I hope I didn't confuse you guys too much there. Now, when it comes to operationally, how I like operating and how I teach operating uh, when it comes to specifically Kerberos tickets is that once you have access to a box, 
the first thing I always recommend is to check for LSS controls. Why check for LSS controls? Because one of the first things that you're going to be doing may touch LSS and it may touch LSS memory. So for example, if the box has silence, um, I have to be careful. Silence, Falcon from, um, also is another one that hooks into LSS and is looking for different stuff that is happening there. So I have to be careful what type of action am I going to perform? Because one of the things that happens is that the version of the OS and the controls that get added to it or configured into the box itself is going to dictate two things for me. Number one is going to dictate the tools that I'm going to be using and how I use them. And number two is going to dictate how fast can I move in that network or my tempo because it is limiting my tools. And at the same time, I may notice that blocks are being collected, stuff is happening. So I have to be very careful with what I'm doing. The next thing I do once I check all of those ELSA's controls is, what, what is my access? Who is this user that I got access to? Is it um, an admin user for a network? Or in the case that I'm going specific af uh, specifically after some information in that network, is this one of those users that's going to have access to it? For example, let's say that we're doing an assessment against a company for whom their contracts are of great value. Uh, let's think of a movie studio whose contracts with the different actors, what they're doing, what they're planning is of great value to them and they don't want to expose all of those details. Uh, well, who's going to have access to that information? Who's going to have recordings of those negotiations? Well, it's going to be the lawyers. So if all of a sudden I land in a box and I see that the target box that I landed on, and I was able to fish successfully as a lawyer, do I really need to go after DA and expose myself to more scrutiny by the controls if that user already have access to the multiple services that I need? So I need to check what is that access and if that access actually fit into my operational parameters of what I'm actually doing. Now, the next task that I always do is, is I list the tickets. I want to know what tickets do I have available uh, and their date and their information. Like, is this ticket about to expire or is this ticket uh, one ticket that I can use for uh, a couple of hours before I need to request a new one or not? And I'll immediately export those tickets. Uh, people many times ask me, why are you always listing and exporting almost automatically? Sometimes I'll even, depending on the framework or the tool, if it is our internal framework, what I work at, or is it using Cobalt Strike or, is it, uh, or using uh, any other framework out there, I typically export the tickets after listing them and I have them as a backup because many times I don't know if I may lose access to that box at any moment. I don't know what is the time window of operation of that blue team for containment. And many times that window may close on me without me uh, knowing it, that one of my actions, previous actions just to get execution may have triggered a process where I may lose that access. So just saving those tickets is kind of like a small insurance for me that will expand my operating time window as I'm moving uh, in the network. And then, what I'm going to do is, depending on the service that I want to access, if I want to access the service, I'm going to request TTSs or ticket granting service tickets to access those different services. Or I'm going to do a perch, remove all of those, request a new TGT, uh, because I can only have one single TGT on uh, my session that I'm operating in. And then I'm going to forge or request what I need and I'm going to leverage and export. Always I'm going to export and just keep those tickets as backups for when I'm doing my operations. Uh, do you have specific tools for checking access and listing tickets? Yes, we're going to be covering Kekeo, Mimikatz, and Rebus uh, from Will. Uh, so we're going to be covering three different tools on listing the tickets and for exporting and working with them, at least the basics of them. I'm not going to go into golden tickets, silver ticket, just the basics of 
uh, exporting and importing those tickets and listing them. Um, for checking access, normally what I use is I use ADSI. Uh, so normally almost all of the frameworks that I work from uh, do support ADSI using C. So typically it is a, we, when we code our implant, our implant talks with the ADSI subsystem via uh, C to be able to perform a query for that user to list the groups and specifically the DN of that user. Once I look at the DN, many times what is going to happen is that organizations decide to organize, uh, to kind of mimic or mirror the way that the organizational uh, structure is set up, or you can you can say the uh, organization tree, how it's set up, mimics very closely or almost exactly to how the OUs are set up in AD many times. So just getting the DN will give me an idea if it is an HR, DevOps, uh, if it is IT or something, just by looking at the DN and then I'll look at the uh, groups that he's a member of and I'll just use a series of uh, AD queries to check who that user is on that box. And many times I don't even need to do that. Uh, many times I'll just go inside of the registry and there's this registry key uh, specifically for GPO history that gets processed every time a user logs on. So when you log on into a box and the GPOs for you, uh, for your account get gets processed, automatically inside of the registry in a key that is readable to everybody gets added all of the different groups that you're a member of. Uh, also all the different GPOs with their ID that get linked to you also get processed. So many times instead of just querying AD, I'll just go into registry, look at that registry specific GPO history. I'll list those, look at them, and just by looking at the read and sets of the accounts, I can then turn them back into uh, group names that I can then use to determine how valuable this user is and how does he fit inside of my operational parameters as I'm doing work. Uh, just in case, I think, yes, I did make some code public. So if you go inside of the trusted sec GitHub account and you look inside of there for a project called Honey Badger, uh, I do have a series of Metasploit uh, modules and plugins. And one of them is an example where I'm actually pulling that data from the registry itself. So no questions. Okay, cool. So let's go straight into leveraging tickets. So when we're working in inside of Windows, uh, one of the first actions that we're going to be doing, in addition to listing tickets, is that we are going to export those tickets. Um, but we have to be very careful when we export tickets. One of the reasons for uh, that we have to be careful when we are doing that export is that no, uh, we can modify the registry to export uh, the TGT with the key, but only if they're not local admin. So if the account is a DA or the account is a local admin, for example, let's say that we want to abuse a Nessus uh, account. People are logging into the boxes with uh, an account that all of a sudden they named Nessus. I've actually seen this before and abused it before. So many times I'll just go after that ticket because normally they'll use that same account across the entire network, same for software distribution, same for software inventory, same for uh, other types of services uh, uh, that need to be uh, run across the network. Many times they'll, they won't set proper controls for those accounts and I'm going to abuse those. So many times they're going to be admin and all of a sudden I export that ticket and I'm going like, oh, awesome. I exported the TGT, I'm going to be able to use this to request other tickets, and no. And other times I'll go into the registry going like, oh, forgot, there's a registry key I need to modify to, to be able to export the ticket. And I modify the registry key and the ticket doesn't work. In fact, this one bit me in the butt when I was doing the labs at DerbyCon. For the first time I did my Mimikest class, I forgot that the user that I was telling students to export the TGT from, even, the, even though the registry key was 
modified in my lab environment, uh, the user was domain admin. So we were not able to export the TGT and use it. And I keep banging my head because I knew it had worked at home when I was doing my labs. And it turned out that, well, when I was doing the labs and setting them up initially at, 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 in my house, I actually was not using a domain admin account to do that. Um, and that one actually bit me in the butt. Uh, thankfully, has not bit me in the butt operationally, but it's something to be aware of. Now, typically, the commands that we're going to be using both in Mimikatz and in Kakeo is going to be um, Kerberos list. Kerberos list is going to list all of the uh, different TGTs and TGSs and their structures. Um, there's another command called Kerberos TGT. Kerberos TGT is going to only list or extract depending on the parameters that I give it the TGT um, service tickets. So it is an all or nothing. I, I'm either listing and exporting all the tickets or I'm just listing and exporting all of the TGT tickets in the case of Mimikatz and Kakeo. Now I have to be very, very, very careful because this, this is when it comes to what I mentioned before that we have to check those LSAS controls. If there are controls already in LSAS, I have to be very careful with the secure LSA tickets command because that command actually gets a handle on the LSS memory to be able to scrape all of that information out. So if there's Falcon on the system, there's silence and, and the silence instance is properly configured, or if all of a sudden they're looking for the um, audit events on Windows, if it's a Windows 10 host, Windows 2016 host, they have the DACL on LSAS, to see if you try to open it and flag you on it, that's going to get you caught. Now, in the case of Rubeos, Rubeos, uh, Rubius, uh, however you, you spell it, um, I speak Spanish, so Rubios, uh, I'm gonna call it. Um, it's more flexible. In fact, when we look at both tools, Mimikat and Kakeo were built as proof of concept tools. Dell P never intended those tools to be used as tech tools. They're just proof of concepts for you to test controls and to show to Microsoft, hey, you need to improve this. Hey, this is how you can get this data. This is why this is not so secure. It's just a proof of concept tool out there. Uh, in the case of Rubius, uh, it's a tool developed by Will Harmjoy, or as I call him, Will Sexy Harmjoy, um, whose main purpose is to be operational. It comes from an attacker's perspective. And what I like is that I can do a triage, Rubio's triage, and it will list all of their tickets and the logon IDs and their time of expiration. So all of a sudden I know how long can I use that ticket and it won't touch LSAS. Then I can do Rubio's K list and it will list all of the tickets and all the detailed information on the tickets like go and it won't touch LSS. And then I can actually dump all of those tickets and it's going to be using a different call that from what Mimikatz is actually using and Kikeo is actually using called LSA call authentication package API call. And since it uses that call, it's not the same as Mimikatz, not a lot of vendors out there are looking at it. I'm able to kind of bypass that. So if all of a sudden, let's take a look here on the machine. So on this machine, I have Kekeo. I can do Kerberos list. I can list the tickets. In this case, uh, I have my TGT. The TGT is always going to be for the service K, um, KRB TGT for, and as you can see, even though I'm running as admin, I'm not able to get access to that key because this user is actually a domain admin, so I'm not able to get there. Now I can see that this user authenticated into LDAP and I'm able to see the service here. So this is automatically to me means that this is a TGS. And one of the things that we're going to be seeing is that we're going to be able to see the encryption key that is used to protect that specific TGS. Now in the case of Rubius, clear, I do triage, 
Rubius will check what is my privilege on the machine and it will give me some extra information. Here you can see the LU, uh, LUID, logon ID. Every logon has its own copy of its TGT and it was going to have its own copy of, the, of a TGS. So the caching member is going to be unique. In this case, Rubius saw that I'm running as administrator. Control, oh, it's not working. Uh, ah, submit is not. One system over here. Submit. If I look over here, you can see that my window here is it actually says administrator. So I'm running as administrator. So Rubius was able to notice that it was running as administrator and it was able to list all of the different tickets without opening LSAS. Now, if I were to do this as a regular user, I will only see those that are specific to my logon ID under which I'm running Rubius. So I have to keep that in mind. That logon ID is critical for us from an attacker's perspective because uh, depending if our pro the process that we landed and created its own logon ID, we probably won't have access to other uh, TGS tickets that the user may be accessing. So many times what will happen is that we, um, the way that the application that provided us access was running under its own logon ID, we list tickets and we don't see access to a lot of stuff, but all of a sudden, when we take a screenshot of the machine of the desktop or we list the applications are running, we're saying, well, he's accessing RDP or he's accessing a share and I don't see a TGS for those services. It just means that we are under another uh, logon ID. So don't worry if that happens to you. Here you can see in contrast for, let me do, Triage. Well, I think it is triage. So here are the tickets for CPRS only. This is one of the things I like about Rubius is it allows me to filter per user, also per type of, of ticket. I can see here that Carlos has actually two different logon IDs. And you can see that on, on, let me put this one here, put this one here. You can see here that Carlos has access only to LDAP on this one and it's TGT under the logon ID 0x3E7. But in addition to that, C4S here also has access to CIF. And we can see that he also has three different uh, TGTs when we're admin because we're pulling that directly from LSAS. So we're pulling all of the information for all of the users in that box. So do be aware that the privilege that you have or the access that you have in that box will dictate what type of information you're going to be able to get. In the case that the framework or tool that you're using, it is not using that specific API call. So let's say you have access to Mimikatz and it's able to run Mimikatz or it's able to run uh, Kakeo in memory, you have, uh, and your admin, those LSS controls all of a sudden become really, really important because your tool, your specific tool and your controls uh, are going to limit uh, what you can actually do on the box. So even though I'm admin, I cannot list all of the tickets for all of the users. Now, in the case that I'm using reviews and I've rewritten it and I've removed uh, almost all signatures from it. I've done all of the uh, strings in it. Just remember, this tool gets flagged just like Mimikatz and others. We have to do due diligence in terms of obfuscating our tool. We're, we should be able to list all of the tickets for all of the users. Does it make sense? If I'm moving too fast, just let me know, guys, if you need me to stop and clarify something or re rewrite a command.
just let me know. Same thing if you're not able to read the text of the commands. Awesome. Uh, is obfuscation of tools a completely different talk? Yes, because you're off, uh, it's an entire process and it's a process that you're going to be redoing on a constant basis. For example, one of my recommendations for red team operations is that at, at index or end of exercise, you have one that is with the customer where you get all of the information and you should have as part of the process, hey, how did you detect us? How did you knew it was us? Can we get screenshots of the detections for our report? You can use that same information then to build your own database um, of pre-checks or guardrails or call it survey or, uh, or uh, call it however you want, different frameworks call it different ways. Uh, so one of the things that I like doing is grabbing that information on what control detected what tool or what part of my tool set and then our initial agent that we code either in BBA, BB script, C, C sharp, whatever. Typically I like doing stages. So the real agent doesn't get pushed. What I typically do is I have a series of low-level commands that will list, um, for example, all uh, go through the registry, look of all um, services keys that are of driver type, and those driver types, it will pull the name and the altitude number. And it will package all of that up in a base64, compress it, send it over to my C2. My C2 will process that and will then put in my screen a list of possible things that may get me caught. In addition to that, based on each index, the information that we gather, we put that inside of a database that then gets processed and says, hey, we saw that Falcon or we saw that silence is on this system. We were able to tag it just by registry key because the advantage there is that we don't need to be a local admin to list those drivers. And at the same time, I'm not putting this large list of drivers inside of my BBA or inside of my BB script or J script or my C code that gets delivered that Defender is going to trigger on it. If you put a large number of sys and Defender sys more than, sys that list of more than two or three security products, it's going to flag on it. For example, that's the signature there um, that will trigger on that file and that specific word document or will trigger on the HTA file. Even if, if you obfuscate it due to MC. Uh, so what happens is that gets gets processed and tells me, hey, this tool may be you get detected. Be careful. And that is the quick thing that we do. And the long term thing is that it goes into a research team that the research team then goes and tries to re obfuscate the tool, see what it's get, getting detected and rewrite the tool and modify the tool for that specific tool set. Sometimes what we'll do is we'll modify the tool to work across multiple uh, tools, uh, controls that the customer may have, or other times we'll have versions that are specifically to bypass Defender, specifically to bypass Silence, and there will be a bit custom. More, of, more than often, we're able to write one that works across all of them. Other times, we just customize it. So that's part of the operating procedures that I try to push forward uh, for operations many times. And I typically, as a researcher, a tool developer, I just try to add as many of those rail guards inside of the tool to offload that from the operator himself. And I'm just protecting the operator by just putting a bunch of red text or yellow text on screen that he needs to be careful. So let's go back to the slides. Now, one of the things that we do have to keep in mind in the case that we're using Mimikatz or Kakao, is that when you export the tickets, uh, it is actually going to create a file with a Kirby extension. Now, you would be very, very, very surprised how many people actually forget to set Base64 out true on 
Mimikatz before they run the command. Many times they'll run it and they'll dump a .kirby file on disk. No application out there generates a .kirby. Only Mimikatz and Kikeo does. So that's a dead giveaway that will get, get you flagged and it will get you detected. So one of my recommendations typically is for you to simply go in and do base64 out to true. So always the output's going to be base64. Do the same for input. So base64 and uh, base64 slash n. Uh, also set it to true so you can copy paste a ba uh, base64 string when you're reimporting tickets uh, into the target box. So you'll have to drop them on disk and report them. You'll be surprised how many people actually did not knew this on when I was teaching the class and as I was teaching the initial classes uh, because normally before I teach a class I'll just grab chunks like I'm doing right now and I'll teach them to multiple groups specifically students and other operators or inside of the um, of work and they'll give me feedback on it. and a lot of people actually did not knew about this base 64 input and output when it came to Mimikatz. One of the things I really do like is, uh, as I'm practicing stuff, is to just use Kekeo. Kekeo has its own ANSI 1 library to parse Kerberos tickets, so the output tends to be better uh, broken down when I'm looking at all of this information, uh, specifically when I'm looking at the different flags uh, that that a ticket may have. If, if it's a renewable, forwardable, pre-authenticated, if it is an initial uh, TGT or not, uh, all kinds of stuff that becomes important for me when I'm doing operational work because I'm not going to try to renew a ticket that is not renewable. I'm not going to try, for example, to use a TGT to change a password if it is not an initial ticket because if it is a delegated ticket, it won't work for changing passwords, uh, stuff like that. Uh, now, when it comes to VM and Go, uh, as I mentioned to you guys, you have to be aware and careful do you always say that base64 it is uh, it, it is not opsec wise to drop Kirby files on disk now normally what happens is if uh, the example above is one example where I'm doing Kerberos list and I'm doing an export and it's going to generate that Kirby file for me and it's getting dropped on disk and so hey I dropped this Kirby file on the machine uh, now the example below what I did is I did base64 out to true and then what I'm going to be getting is that output as a base64 string that I can copy, paste, remove, remove the new cards returns, and then use that uh, as an input to re-import that ticket uh, on, a, on a separate box, a separate session, to then be able to connect. As I mentioned, uh, Rubius, as you saw uh, when I did the example, I'm able to list uh, all of the tickets if I'm running as admin or lo uh, local admin or I'm running a system on the target box. Uh, if I'm running a system or also um, local admin, one of the things I like is I also get the machine um, tickets that it may have, and that way I can impersonate the machine when accessing stuff, depending if the machine has uh, privileges to uh, access stuff. Uh, one of my favorite one is the... Um, let's say that you're running SCCM. Many times what happens is that people kind of cut corners when they're setting up the uh, SCCM and they grab that machine that does all of the inventory and package distribution. Uh, you're supposed to give it some specific permissions and put in some specific groups when you're doing all of that setup. Many What, what many do is just to, because they're lazy and they want to go through the extra effort, they'll make that machine account actually DA. I've seen that in environments, and I can just go after that machine account, go after its tickets, and then use that to then be DA in the network and move uh, to other hosts. And since that machine's already touching a bunch of other hosts, it blends in inside of the logs uh, if somebody's doing a threat hunting exercise and looking at the logs, and they're just grouping by machine and what they're accessing. So I typically go there. I hope that you guys don't mind me going on tangents and offsec and operational stuff and not only being 
on Cabros. It's just that that's the stuff that I really, really like is all of the operational stuff. Um, Rebeos has the KList command. Uh, one of the things about the KList command is that the KList command will include a lot more information. <coughs> sure about that. The um, triage only gives me a quick view of the information there. KList will actually give me all of the details on the ticket itself, including the different flags for it. Uh, one, one of the things I like is that um, that wheel did is at the top, as you can see, it broken down by user, domain, login ID, SID, authentication package, logon type, if it is an interactive, not interactive. So I have an idea on how they're actually uh, communicating to that box. So for me, that's important because that tells me if it is it's a service, something automated, or if it is somebody connecting uh, straight into the keyboard on that machine, or if it is in via RDP and how, just in general, how they're connecting to the machine itself. And then it breaks down all of the information on the ticks themselves. As I mentioned, Rubius tends to be more of an operational tool developed by somebody that with an operational mindset. Now with Rubius, if I wanna uh, get the information, you just do the dump command on it and it will automatically for you export everything as base64 it won't dump those files to disk as i said as i said it's kind of like from a operational perspective what is actually happening there now one of the things i like about rubius uh that is a bit different from uh, mimikat san kikeo is that i can actually filter for services so let's say i only want to list the tickets that are for SIF, or I want to list the tickets that are specifically for term SRV, for terminal services, RDP, I can actually just target those specific tickets. I don't have to dump them all and process them all. I just got to go after specific services. I, I can be very, very targeted and selective in the stuff that I do. Uh, and I like that it has that service and I can just give it the SPN and then I can just list it or dump those specific tickets that I want. Uh, also, I can do it by session, so I can select tickets for a specific session that I want and just ignore uh, tickets for any other session. Uh, for example, let's say that all of a sudden, um, when I'm uh, operational example on that one, I'm getting on the target box, I'm Local admin, there are multiple logon sessions for that user with multiple logon IDs, and I see multiple TGT tickets and TGS tickets. And I can see that some of them for one session, the tickets are of a longer life uh, than others for that specific user because that session or so was created somehow after the user initial logon. I can target specifically the tickets for that specific logon ID, because I know those are the ones that will have a longer life and I need to worry less about exporting those or renewing those uh, would be the correct word there. Now, as I mentioned, exporting that TGT is painful. Um, if I want to export that TGT, uh, if it is a local admin, I'm not able to export that ticket. If the uh, even if I mod and if it is a regular user, I need to modify the registry to be able to export it to get that TGT, and then I may have to be system, which means talking uh, touching LSAS memory, which means me getting detected and me getting uh, losing my access uh, be being being contained inside of the network. So I have, um, I have to be very careful with TGTs because I want that TGT so I'm able to request other TGSs. Now, one of the best ways for me to do that is to get what we call a delegated ticket. I'll get a bit more uh, on that. Bef uh, before that, I'm going to cover uh, why you, you need to be careful. In Windows 10 and Windows 2016 and higher versions of Windows, uh, Microsoft set up a DACL 
on LSAS. So if at any moment you open uh, LSAS, there's going to be a specific event called 4663 that's going to get generated. For some reason, in the case of Mimikatz, it doesn't uh, generate that event. Uh, I still haven't pinpointed why, uh, but it indicates that Sysmon is present on the system. Sysmon is actually going to flag, and it's going to flag when a OX, OX uh, 1010 is what it's going to open and flag you with in the case of Sysmon. I, I actually had an example for Sysmon. Um, so yeah, there's the example where Mimikas is actually accessing um, L LSAS memory. It's open LSAS memory, Sysmon of NID 10. And you can see that the granted access as it was opening the process was an OX 1010. Now, one of the things I can actually do, yeah, review says multiple tickets under session key is run with local admin privilege. Okay. In the case of Rebeos, if I'm at local admin, I'm able to extract the TGT when it's ticket, and it will not open LSAS memory due to the calls that uh, Will is actually using. Uh, it does have its own other set of IOCs. Um, I'll probably cover that in another webcast or something else. I'm still exploring those, but it does have its own other set of IOCs that I was looking at and discussing with a coworker yesterday, and he pointed out those additional IOCs. I still need to set up set up something in lab to capture those specific events, enable specific some specific audits to be able to look at those. So as I mentioned, one of the things that we can do is we can ask for a TGT. So when we're asking for a TGT, what we're uh, actually doing is we're just reusing the user's password. We're rehashing that password, sending it over to the KDC, and then the KDC is then giving me a brand new initial TGT. That's, it. That's important, an initial TGT. So that TGT, I can use it, for example, to change a user's password through Kerberos, uh, because the RFC for change password actually requires that that ticket needs to be initial. It cannot be a delegated one. So the only way I can actually get a TGT is if I know the password. That's the only way I can get an initial TGT uh, using uh, Kerberos or using Rubius. Using Rubius is I need to be at local admin, but if I'm not, I still need the password to be able to get it. Now, in the case of Rubius, I have the password and I can actually um, specify when I'm requesting that password, how do I want that password hashed? So I can actually specify, hey, use RC4, use AES, use DES. My recommendation operationally, if you ever, ever, ever do it with AS128, RC4, or DES, I'm kicking your ass. Uh, always do it with AS256. That's the default on all modern versions of Windows. So why do we want to do it with RC4 or DES? Mm, I don't see many cases unless it is a account that is a service where automatically it's going to be RC4, then I may switch to RC4 just to blend in. Outside of that, always try to stick with AES-256 in those cases when you're using the ASK TGT. Now, as a regular user, I'm not able to export that key. I don't have access probably to the uh, password of the user clear text password because Hold and behold, we found a user that doesn't reuse passwords and the password's not in, inside of Firefox or inside of Edge or inside of Chrome or inside of any other app that we're able to get that password from. Damn it. They did proper diligence. We don't have that clear text password to abuse. How can we get a TGT? Because we want a TGT, especially the one that lasts 10 hours for our operational window that later we can renew. But we can reuse it in case we lose access. We need that TGT. Also, that TGT allows me to request 
TGS uh, tickets on another machine under the context of that other user. So what we can do is we can just be very nice and just ask for a service that has uh, that is set up to um, that is set up for delegation for Kerberos only for the computer account to give us a delegated TGT. Normally, in most environments, that's going to be the domain controller. So what we're going to be using is we're going to be using the Kerberos ESS API to then go to the domain controller and say, hey, domain controller, do me a solid. Can you give me a delegated TGT? I need one. Come on, buddy. Be a, be a doll. And the DC will actually give you that TGT. It's going to be a delegated one, so we can not use it for changing password, but, but for just requesting TGSs, it works perfectly. So the way it would work inside of Kakeo, same for um, Mimikatz, is that we can actually do uh, TGT, colon, colon, the leg. Uh, if, we do, if we run it without specifying a service, a server, it will actually find what is the domain controller for that specific site and it will pull the information from it. One of the things that you can do is you can enumerate AD and find other servers to have that server's other server request that for you uh, in case you want to kind of muddy the waters in terms of operations. If the blue team's actually looking for people going and asking for delegated tickets straight from the domain controller. You can just specify an FQDN. Remember, since we're working with Kerberos, it has to be FQDN. So what we would do there is we would actually use an LDAP filter to find those hosts. Um, those hosts typically are user account control uh, 1, 2, 8, 40, 1, 1, 3, 5, 5, 6, dot 1, dot 4, dot 8, 803. That is a bitwise and operator uh, for LDAP. Yes, that is an bitwise and operator, that large number. And we're looking for the value 524288. That means that that mission specific machine is allowed to delegate uh, specifically under Kerberos and we're able to pull that key from or request a TGT from that machine and use that. Also, if, if we want, we can just go into group policy history key and we can just Get, hey, what is the domain controller that processes GPO for this specific machine? And we can just point to it. If we don't want to let Mimikatz be the one that um, does the query for us. Now, you may go like, hey, Carlos, why all of this extra information if Mimikatz is already going to look for this or Rebeos is going to look for this? Well, our good friends at Microsoft added to Windows Defender the capability to find executables doing LDAP queries. Uh, so they're going to know that Notepad never does LDAP queries and all of a sudden LDAP is doing queries. So they're going to be able to have that extra information in which they can flag our operation on. So we have to be careful now, with, depending on the controls of the systems, they're using Windows Defender ATP or not. Uh, if what executable we're actually using to do queries against the uh, LDAP itself. If we're using explorer.exe or we, if it is MMC, uh, an MMC, oh, awesome. That's normal for them to do that kind of stuff. But Notepad uh, or mm, looks funny. PowerShell, mm, unless I have logon scripts that when they run the machine actually do some LDAP kind of stuff and looks like an odd behavior. So just some offset uh, advice there on where to pull your information if you want to pull it. Uh, before you do some uh, some stuff. Now, in the case of reviews, the way that we are able to get that information is that we do reviews TGT deleg, and reviews is actually going to contact for us the domain controller uh, specifically for that site, and it's going to be able to uh, to pull it for us. And it's going to target the nearest un unconstrained server by LDAP search. So Rubius is going to perform that LDAP search for us. Now, normally Rubius is a, a .NET binary, and I would say Falcon, 
uh, silence and many others. Uh, nowadays, trigger, if you're using, for example, Cabal Strike and you're loading .NET, it will trigger on those on specific services. And it's not triggering that .NET is actually being loaded into a process. It's the way that the pro process injection is actually happening. Uh, so do be aware of that when you're trying to use Rubius on a target box. Now, what, now we have our tickets. Now we want to leverage those tickets. We want to use those tickets. So, uh, so far, what I've covered to you is some operational guidelines on how do you how you should work with the tickets. How do you select which tickets to export, and why would you export them? Um, and it has to do everything with time windows and what value do they have? What how critical are they for you? Can use them for getting access. Now we want to leverage those. Now let's say that we lost access and we're in another box and we want to use those tickets in this other box to impersonate this user to connect. Because remember, it doesn't care from who the ticket came from because we're bypassing all of that stuff uh, in the Windows SSP. So we can impersonate that user in another box just by having their ticket. So to do this, we need to flush the cache for that specific logon ID so we can remove that TGT and we're able to place our TGT that we backed up back into our attacker's machine to be able to request the multiple TGSs. Or we're just going to uh, upload to the machine only the TGS. But if I need to leverage a TGT, one thing very important to remember is that there can only be one single TGT per login session. Or LUID because if we look over if we look over here multiple LUIDs each LUID has their own TGT the only thing that differentiates one from the other is the LUID and why does this guy have to Hmm. I'll need to ask Bill on this one. Repeated LUID. Hmm. But normally that should not work. That user should not, or probably while I was prepping and doing exercises, I exported and imported that ticket. Uh, and I have two in that should not work if I try to request a TGS, but uh, demo got, I'll get that to that later. So typically, uh, Rebus is going to um, output the base64 string. And if I want to use that base64 string, one of the things that I need to remember is to remove all of the cache returns from it to be able to then put it as a single string so I can paste it. In the case of Mimikas, I need to do the same thing. I need to replace that new cars return to have it as a single string that then I can pass over if I have uh, imp uh, input set uh, base64 and set to true. And Rubius, it just go Rubius XE slash ticket, and then I put my base64. In the case of Cabros, if I want to perch, uh, in the case of uh, Kikeo and Mimikas, I can perch all tickets with the command perch, same was as, as in Rubius. And then when I want to add that ticket, I, I can request a TGS ticket. Um, so one of the things to remember, um, did I cover the flag? I don't think I, I covered the flag for importing on Kerberos. So typically uh, for um, Kekeo and for uh, Mimikets. So they have their own flag for importing the ticket and uh, their own parameter. So instead of just putting in the path for the .kirby file, I just put the base64. So when in Mimikas and 
Gekeo, you set Base64N to true. What it does, it, it does uh, a patch in memory or sets a, a variable in memory that what actually does is anything that is I.O. related for input and output now is Base64 string. So any other command inside of Mimikatz, any other command in Kakeo that you can point it to a file or to a directory, now what you would do is you would simply uh, give it a Base64 string to import that ticket. So what happens if I want to target a specific service that is not in that cache or something that I did not export? The way I would do that is I would do Kerberos ask, and with Kerberos ask in the case of Kakeo, I can just go, hey, I want this specific SPN. So I can just go in my target, this is the SPN slash and the FQDN of the machine that I, I want that ticket for. And that will generate TGS for me. Once I get that TGS, first thing I do, I export that. Uh, in the case of Kerberos and Kakeo, also I can specify the algorithm. Remember, stay with AS256 when you're doing uh, when you're requesting that ticket. And also, you can request and export at the same time if you do slash export. So here's an example in Kakeo where I'm doing Kerberos ask. I'm asking for the SIF or the um, to access a chair. And then I'm specifying AES-128. And more than likely, if the blue team knows their stuff, they're going to be able to flag on this. So this would be one of the examples that I would do, uh, for example, if we're doing a purple team engagement. When we're doing tabletop exercises with the blue team, one of the things is that, well, we're going to be requesting a bunch of tickets. Let's see how your detections are. And sometimes we'll just do this. RC4, AS128, and then we'll request a 256. And just to see if they're able to flag on outliers in terms of the encrypt, uh, encryption uh, of the tickets. Many times what they'll do, they'll flag on the value 17 or type of encryption that is uh, a value 17. That means that they're using RC4 because they're looking for Kerberos and stuff. But many times they were not looking, for example, for AS-128. Somebody made an example or so, uh, uh, made a mistake or somebody's using triple desk or something like that. Now in reviews, we have a bit more uh, options here for us. Uh, in the case of our good friend Mimikas and Kekeo, Everything's going to happen under the context that we're running the tool. In the case of Rubius, we can actually impersonate another user. So we can actually uh, give it the, the clear text password for what we are requesting, or we can give it the hash to get that TGS of, of that password. So I'm not able to get a TGT, but I'm able to get a TGS if I have the hash, if I'm using Rubius. So do keep that in mind. So with Rubius is ask TGT, ask TGS service, I provide the SPN, and then I can provide, if I want as optional parameters, the user, uh, the username, if I'm providing a hash, or I can provide the uh, clear text password, how, what is the encryption type uh, that I'm requesting, and also uh, base64 for the ticket. Now, one of the things that I like about, um, and the reason for that ticket uh, parameter here that you saw here is that I can pass it a valid TGS ticket. And what I can do is I can grab that ticket and I can modify the SPN. So the SPN is not part of the pack of the ticket of that value that gets calculated and hashed. So if I have a valid TGS with Rubius, I can switch um, SPNs on it. So I'm able to, I don't need to request another TGS to the KDC is what I want to say. So that is very, very useful. And if I want to automatically load uh, that ticket back into Rubius into the log on ID, I can just pass it slash PTT 
So that's an option for you. So that ticket, I just passed the base64, modify it, reuse it for another SPN. And I don't need to contact the KDC for anything to get uh, a new TGS. I think that's super cool in my opinion. Now when passing the ticket operationally, in the case of Rubius, one of my recommendations is that um, if you're going in an environment that is using a software distribution service, that is using, uh, for example, Nessus to do constant scans or any piece of software that is connecting to the machine, you can do filter user uh, with monitor to monitor for somebody specifically logging into that machine and dumping their ticket. Uh, so this is very useful for that type of targeted attack. Uh, so this is another operational recommendation that I would have for you in the case that you're using Rubius. So this is the last part of the uh, webcast. Uh, we've reached, I know, in fact, we went 18 minutes over the hour. Sorry for that. Um, I hope that you guys found the information useful.